praise. Amen. Here and around the world, we glorify you. Amen. God bless you. Welcome once again. Just take a moment right now. Go around, bless somebody, encourage somebody in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever you are today, we just want you to know that the love and the grace and the presence of the Lord is right there with you. Amen. He is real. He is able to help you. He is able to answer your cry today. Amen. If you have never prayed, if you've never called on the Lord, call upon him today. He will answer you. He will show you great and mighty things that are beyond your imagination. God bless you today. Welcome, welcome in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is good, amen.
God is able. Tell somebody else he's able. Y'all ready? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, all you could ask.
on God. Let me talk to you over here. Has anybody ever wanted to give up? Has anybody ever wanted to just throw in the towel? I don't. Anybody know God to be able? <laughs> don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you believe he's able, give him a shout this morning. If you believe he's able, come on, give him a shout. If you believe he's able, come on, Father, let me hear you say, oh! Everybody say it. sing that a time or two. Everybody here, all over this building, around the world, look up to heaven and say, you're able. Thank you. 
let's lift up our hands and sing holy 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 lord god almighty the first in the stanza let's just worship the lord this morning you Lord even as we come Lord God to lift up your name and magnify you we have so much to give thanks to you for Lord for the provision and the protections afforded to us for all the kind gestures of your manifold blessing Lord we see it in our spiritual mental emotional into our physical and our entire well-being lord you have sustained us and watched over us and kept us oh lord and our city and our nation and the nations before you and our father we want to thank you thank you from the very bottom of our heart even as we bring our praises to you be lifted up be magnified be adored oh lord there is no one but you and we come oh god in the name of jesus to honor you to lift you to thank you and now lord even as we your people gather together with praises in our hearts even through difficult times so many people are going through i pray for your people those that are here and those that are watching across the world reach out to lord your people you know lord god the needs you know lord god the provision that they require meet them according to the riches of your glory and minister spiritual strength salvation and healing and deliverance as we send forth the word of healing of deliverance of provision of salvation and thank you father because the holy spirit is empowering your people and filling all things in all according to your greatness and power O god far beyond what we can even imagine or comprehend may you be praised and father we just pray for our community and for our children and for our nations and the many volatile regions of the world where there's either lack of rain or too much rain or whether oh god there is so much of desperation need and and particularly lord where there's warfare and hurt and violence we pray god for peace 
And thank you, God, that we can come with these needs. Hear our prayer even as we bring these to you, Lord. And now, Father, be pleased, O oh God, to visit us with your presence. Revive us, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit. Refresh us with your anointing. And we be careful to give glory and honor and praise to you in and through the mighty and precious and wonderful name of Jesus. And our Father, we just want to lift up particularly Frank Bermudez, O oh God, on the loss of his mother. And we pray for him today. And he's with us in the midst of all of this. Be with him, strengthen him and the family. In Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen and amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome once again. This is our third service. The first is at 7, the second at 8, the, the third is this one at 10.30, and then we have the 3, three o'clock service. And then the Wednesday is our midweek service. We welcome you all, and particularly those that are watching by way of uh, Facebook or internet or television. Thank you for being with us and in this wonderful day. And if you can get an opportunity, just share so that many others will watch. We get almost uh, every week, by the end of the week, almost uh, 300,000 people watching this, and they are a large congregation across the world. The young ones are coming to sing and praise the Lord. So let's just join together and uh, welcome the presence of the Lord. And, and as the Lord welcomes us, can you say, thank you, Lord? We sense your presence. We sense, oh God, your awesome presence. We honor you. We praise you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. God's people said, good how many people want to please God that's your heart's desire no seriously how many of you really want to please the Lord you really want to make God happy you say with your life God I want to make you happy with my life God I want to please you each and every step of my way that one thing have I desired and that will I seek for is to dwell in the house of the Lord and though we may be away or though we're near our aim is to please God if that's your heart's desire, just lift those hands and just tell God, I just want to please you. Hallelujah. The song is simple. It says, I want to please you, Lord, more and more each day. I want to please you, Lord, each and every step of my way. I want to be close to you so I can say, I just want to please you. I just want to please you. I want to make you happy. desire. Come on, sing with me each and every step. I want to be close to you. Come on. So I can say Uh-huh. I want to please you Lord more. More and more each day. Now that you have it, say I want to. Come on. I want to please you Lord. With my walk, with my talk, each and every step. I want to be close. 
close to you. I want to be close to you. So I can say, I want to, I want to please you, Lord, more and more each day. And if that's your prayer, help us sing, I want to, come on. I want to please you, Lord, make that your heart prayer today, more and more. I want to please you, I want to please you, Lord, each and every step. say so I want to be close. Come on. I want to be close to you. I want to. I want to be close to you. Come on, just the congregation. I want to. I want. That's what all God wants. I want to. 
That's all I want to be close. Come on, help me say I want to, I want to. Here we go. I want to be close to you. I want to be close to you so I can say, so I can say, I want to please you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That indeed is a powerful song. I want to please you, Lord. And this morning we want to continue the answer to the question, how then can I please God? And we have done two segments, and we want to continue in this part as well. Pleasing God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5 tells us about this man named Enoch. And it says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he had this testimony before his translation that he pleased God. That is a powerful comment, a powerful report, a powerful testimony that he pleased God. When you go into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul is saying whether we labor, that whether present or absent, we be pleasing or accepted of God. And again in Colossians chapter 1, and verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And finally, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, proving what is pleasing or acceptable to God. How then can I please God? We'd be doing a couple of very important subject, but right on the top of the list, I want to mention faith. I know love would be there, but I would certainly talk about love and sacrifice and worship. But on the high, on the totem pole, on the topmost, is this word faith. Because coming back to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, it talks about Enoch and what it says about him. He had this report, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Here's a report, here's a statement, here's a testimony of an ordinary man like you and me. In a time in which he lived, it was an ungodly age. Because in the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, he's talking about how thousands and ten thousands of the saints are coming. He looked forward to that great and marvelous day. People in that time of ungodly ways, ungodly people, and yet he chose to walk with God, and he pleased God. Just a statement, he walked with God is phenomenal. But then this testimony from God, he pleased God. How did he please God? Verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So on the topmost, I want to say the highest order above everything else is faith. And everything else is then a product is mingled with or a child of faith. Whether good works, by faith. Worship, sacrifice, by faith. Love, by faith. Everything must be sorted with faith. Because the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The word impossible with this word without, just not possible, impotent. An important statement is with faith, possible, very possible to please God without faith. It is impossible. So we need to get this very important 
that this is the linga fraga, this is the language by which God hears us. It is faith. It doesn't matter how much we knock our head down and how much we pour holy water and how much we do spiritual gymnastic or exercise. Without faith, it's not going to please God. It must be with faith. Our love, our sacrifice, our worship, our everything that will please God must be sorted with faith. Because the Bible simply says, he that comes to God, and that means it is this faith that draws us to God, must believe, and faith must come with belief. But not simply a belief system of a dogma or a creed or something that we believe God did in the past, but he must believe that God is and not God was. God did great things during the time of Moses. God did great things in the time of David. A lot of people will say yes to that. But is he the same God who will do the same things today? Then that's the problem. So when we think in terms of faith, it draws us to God. It makes us believe that God is not a was. He's still the I am, the ever-present, the unchanging God yesterday, today, and forever. And that's what Hebrews chapter 13 tells us. Verse 8, the same unchanging. Jesus yesterday and today and forever. And something else it tells us that he that comes to God must believe that God is a rewarder of all that diligently seek him, that we must know he's a rewarder. That he's simply not making these promises and not fulfilling it. We must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of all those that diligently seek him. Now we, when you look into this passage, you're going to find particularly in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it's an awesome passage of uh, these ordinary men. Well, we could have chosen some great men from the scriptures, uh, their ability, their strength, their ingenuity, all of this is just awesome. But what God has chosen in this great hall of fame or the book that we call in this chapter, the heroes of faith are just the garden variety people, ordinary people just like you and me. But what makes them so unique to find mention in this chapter on the heroes of faith was because of what they possessed, of what they have, and that is faith. In the most difficult circumstances of life, and understand, you will hit against some rough patch, some rough road, some blockage, obstruction, and all sorts of difficulties. No one is exempt from that. But here in the midst of it, their faith begin to work out. And so it's remarkable to find in the way in which they pleased God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 talks about Abel, that he brought an excellent sacrifice. And the Bible says a more excellent sacrifice than Cain figuratively or aesthetically or religiously or ritualistically, if you were to speak on any other count, Cain, his offering beats hand down. I mean, it's just marvelous. Who would not want to have flowers? The fragrance, the beauty, the color, and all of that wonderful thing, all the fruits or the, the things that comes and springs out of the earth, it is magnificent for the gods. I said aesthetically, religiously, but in the contest of worship, the blood is important. We don't have that and no churches should have that, but simply meaning there was once and for a blood spilled by faith. Abel looked up ahead of time and understood what it is without the blood, there is no redemption. And he understood what pleases God and we understand the blood of, will never lose its power. And what Abel brought may not have been aesthetically beautiful or religiously sane, or what people would have said, this is gross. He brought what was God's way of thinking. 
Religion, as fine as it is, is eloquent, it is philosophical, it is the best man, man can make to be able to approach God and man's ways. Nothing wrong with that, except that is a God's way. And what Abel did was, how then can I please God? And this was a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and he obtained a witness, he was righteous, God testifying his gift, and that is a tremendous way to please God. The next verse talks about Enoch and how we please God. Verse 6 tells us how, and that is by faith. Verse 7 talks about Noah by faith building. It is whether you build, whether you are construction, whether it's your spiritual life, whether it's any aspect of your business, it must be with faith. Even in a home, except the Lord be in it, it is a vain work. And so it must be with faith. When you turn to verse 8, it is talking about Abraham by faith, this man who was left that Mesopotamia. In verse 10, he looked towards the city that was built by God, God calling him, which has no foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 17 is the offering up of Isaac by Abraham when he was tried, tested, offered up Isaac, and that is powerful. It's all by faith that touched the heart, that pleased the heart of God. When you turn to verse 20, you find Isaac blessing his children, or in verse 21, Jacob's on the bed leaning on a cane and blessing his children. And when you turn down to verse uh, 22, you see Joseph, the same, but what is so remarkable by faith, he made mention, commandment of his bones. By faith, he realized that his people will not be in Egypt for a long time, and the bones spoke to people. In their harshest, difficult time, they could always point to that place that was not permanently cemented in Egypt because he knew the bones will be carried to the promised land. He believed it, and that was a faith that pleased God. And as you go on further, you find about Moses in verse 23 and 25, and verse 27, we find in 28, how they crossed the Red Sea, how they kept the Passover. Verse 30, the falling of Jericho, it is by faith. And then when you come to verse 31, an ordinary person by the name of Rahab, these are the ordinary garden variety people that God could have picked up some of the marvelous, magnificent people, but God chose the ordinary people. They please God. And you please God in that faith that you have. So we need to realize that there is something called faith less, less of faith, or faithful, full of faith. I like the way the book of Proverbs, chapter 28 and verse 20 tells us, a faithful man abounds in blessing. That simply is powerful word, Proverbs 28 and verse 20. A man that is full of faith shall abound with blessing because faith attracts, faith is a mag magnet that brings the blessings. And we need to realize in terms of the world in which we live, there is a currency there is a way in which we are able by hard work and all of this are important. But when it comes to the spiritual, spiritual things first. First the spiritual, the book of Corinthians 15 says, and then the natural. And so in terms of spiritual things, highest on the order is God looks deep down. Because he did talk to Samuel and said in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, not like man who looks at the outward, God looks into the inward, into the inward. Jesus went to his village, and in Mark chapter 6 and verse 6, he marveled, because they had no faith, because of their unbelief. He went around about the village and teaching, but there was no miracle except a few, because they did not have faith. How could it be that 
people had no faith in that village. They were religious. Mark you that word. They bowed down before him. They went to the temple. They went to the, ma to the synagogues. They did everything that a religious person should do. They dressed religiously. They ate the religious type of kosher food. In all sense, they smelled religious. They talked religious. They did that was religious. But unfortunately, in the eyes of God, there was no faith. All of the externals were very commendable. It is something that you could write home and say, these are awesome, wonderful religious people. But God looked to the inside and he was astounded. He was marveled at their unbelief. So outwardly, we could look at the Elodishian church and say, marvelous, spectacular, awesome church. Because all that we see on the outward, but God looks to the inward. A church, a small church in Philadelphia, a church of love. Because God is not looking the externals, he's looking in the internals. He looks to the heart. What you find is, while it says there is no faith, every one of us will have come into this world with an element of faith and Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20 simply tells us it is the mustard seed like faith. And that little faith can say to the mountain, remove hands to yonder and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible to you. Why? Even with a mustard seed size of a faith. Every one of us have this little, little tiny seed. And we must be able to nurture it. We must like a little garden that plants that seed you can hardly see and yet be able to prepare the land, to be able to plow it and to be able to make ready and then of course to make sure with divine help of sunshine and all the necessary things as well as watering and making sure it's fertile and it's basically got the right soil and we be able to do all that is while divine sovereignty is taking place, the human responsibility in seeing that little seed now begin to shoot up and become a tender plant ultimately becoming a tree. So there's a stage, there's a progression. And what Jesus is saying, because of your unbelief, I say unto you, if you have faith as a must, grain of a mustard seed, we must exercise that faith, beginning to nurture it and exercise it, otherwise it would become limb. It's useless, it's worthless. Something such magnificent, greater than a diamond, is deep down and yet you can't attract, yet you can't please God. In spite of all the religious, in spite of all the ritualistic, in spite of all the way in which an obligation in the religious world could be done. And yet, the Bible says, because of your unbelief. And yet when Jesus looks at the centurion, by the way, he was not born and brought up in the luxury of a, of a very strong Hebrew root. He was not from Judah. He was nothing from any of the tribe. But in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, a century on, listen to what he says, speak the word and my servant shall be healed. You don't need to come to my house. Speak the word because I understand what the authority of and the power of word is. I'm a man that has people under my authority, and I myself am under the authority of, the cent of, the, of Caesar. I can tell a man, go, he goes, and if the one above me tells me, go, I go. So I understand how it works. Say the word. Say the word. And in verse 10, Jesus, look at the word it says. Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. It's something he has. It's something he possesses. It's something he cultivated. In spite of the fact he didn't, he did not have the luxury to be born into a Hebrew home. It was inculcated. It was practiced. It was disciplined. It was something that he put priority into his faith.
to believe God, to trust, to be able to have faith in God. When you look at Abraham, he was a Syrian, simply born into a great civilization of the past, Mesopotamia. And then the word of God comes to him, leave the land. God reached out to him, this unknown man. And of course, we know the name Abraham, who became Abraham, simply meaning father of one, and then called father of a nation. But he struggled. There were moments in his life he doubted. But there was what would call a growing faith, a progressive faith. Ultimately, it comes to a point, not wicked faith, but the Bible talks about it as strong in faith. Description, adjective, poured upon it. Not weak in faith, strong in faith. And what does that do? If you turn with me to Romans chapter 4 and verse 20, let's read verse 19 first. Romans chapter 4 and verse 19. Listen, and being not weak in faith, so it tells you he was not weak in faith. He considered not his body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. The fact of the matter is, his body was for all intent dead and the barren. And the fact is Sarah could never have a child at 90. He was a hundred. It was impossible. But he did not consider that. That would be the thing to consider. Every one of us, born of a mother here, would consider this. We would come to the house of the Lord and say, Lord, my health, my money, my business, my family is at stake. Who wouldn't? That would be where we would accentuate, Lord, help me. Where are you, Lord? Our prayers would be prayers of complaint in a nice way. We put it in Jesus' name. Nevertheless, it is 90% about our problems, our needs, our situation. But here is this man. He was not weak in faith. It's exactly opposite of what we would be doing. He did not consider his body now dead when he was 100 years old, nor the barrenness and the deadness of Sarah's womb. My goodness, that is what he should be concentrating on. That child that was promised would come from him and from the bowels of Sarah, impossible. He should be saying, God, what is the problem here? I was called Abraham, a father of one, and now it's madness. I'm the laughing stock. I'm the father of nation. And look at me. Look at Sarah. He did not consider. So here you find a man not weak in faith will not consider is present complication, is present predica predicament. So you may be in terms of something of a job, and you're saying, Lord, what is going on? Or you could say, that's not a big criteria. I don't know what's going on, but I know God is in control of it. Your health issue, Lord, I don't know what's going on, Lord. You know everything. You knew me long before I was born. You knew the day, you knew the time. You'll also know when I will leave. It's in your hand. I want you to understand it could be your business. It could be about everything that you are worried about this morning. Would that be your biggest concentration? Consideration? Surely that would be a big consideration to ring the bell, knock our head, come to church, cry our heart out. But here was this man not weak in faith. He did not consider what was paramount important to him. Everything swings on this, his name, his reputation. The fact that, even the fact people say, is your God truly God? Everything depended on this, but that did not worth considering. But what was so amazing in the next verse, he staggered not at the promise of God. He staggered not. I would be staggered. You would be staggered. Let's talk about this. This man who is called father of nation. Father of a, 
of one suddenly become a father of nation and then God says you will be father of nations you will fall down shocked beyond belief you say I don't even have a child and you're telling me father of nation people are already laughing how much more would they want to laugh they will toast in my name and say look at that fool it's like having peace as my name and joy as my name and it's total confusion is a whirlpool that sucks everything out and breathing forever forget about peace and joy God what's going on he staggered not at the promise but was again look at this strong in faith but what he did here was giving glory to God how could you give glory to God when there's such a Damascene sword on top of your head is going to come right in the man is not considering his impossible state but looking at the one that he can please for without play without faith you cannot please God impossible but with God all things are possible with faith so here you find an amazing aspect of giving glory that was his priority so God looks to this man's heart and says look at him he's not staggering he's not weak in faith he's not considering his impossible situation that's the man I love may we become people of faith that would move from that little mustard seed like faith into something that even the Bible calls not weak in faith but strong to be able to cultivate to be able to inculcate to be able to nurture to be able to feed on that with the spiritual the world around looks at the stature and the size of our bank account or all of the things that the man would love to see for God he looks in the inside and look at faith and we have talked about it so many times I don't need to go there but I want to go into running into number two and that is called trust the word faith and trust are used interchangeable they can be used one or the other almost looks like the same and can be placed one across the other and substitute for another but really they are not the same you see in our own spiritual disciplines in the ministries we have ministries that are so linked together you have prayer and intercession come on prayer should be intercession and intercession should be prayer no they are both and yet there's a marked difference or prayer intercession and deliverance doesn't deliverance have to do with intercessions and prayer and yet they are marked different oh what about prayer worship deliverance and so forth intercession they are all the same prayer but yet there is a distinction when you look at it minutely they basically can be interchanged I made intercession for you or I made prayer for you could be right and yet when you are interceding it is different from worship although it's all under one like ENT specialist ear and nose and throat and yet in a specialist there's a nose specialist a ear specialist and a throat specialist and yet you can lump them together as ENT so faith and trust can almost be identical and yet it is so different because along the line of faith comes trust now I want you to understand faith merges with trust like we have the choir you have the youth you have the regular sanctuary choir and then you have the kids the little bits and then we lump them together and call them the mass choir and yet they are all different little children sing their own song the youth will sing another and the choirs here in the sanctuary will sing worship 
But yet we bring them all together with no distinction at times called mass, but there is distinction. What I want to talk about is belief in God is not so much all the time trusting God. I want you to understand trusting God is larger than believing God. James chapter 2 and verse 19. Listen to what James said. You believe there is one God. You do well. The devil also believes, but he does better than you. He trembles. Devil is shaking in his boots because he believes. I mean, he knows. He's seen. He has worshipped God. But even though he believes in God, he simply cannot trust God. He can only trust himself. So, what we are talking about is some people can believe God and yet find it difficult to trust God. There are believers who will believe and they will say, I believe in the Bible. But when it comes to trusting for their particular need in this 21st century, it is a heartache. It's hard call. It is difficult. You know, when you go into the Bible, you're going to find situations where people had faith, but then they had to come to that level as they moved and progressed into what would be a t trust. If you turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. This is what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. Understanding is important. When we come to the house of God, and particularly when we praise God, we got to carry an understanding in our mind. I will praise Him with understanding, and I will praise Him in, in spirit. I will praise Him for what He did for me, providing my needs, because I have memory to say, thank you God, because you've done all this. And then I would pray in the spirit. I would sing with understanding, and I will sing in the spirit. There is one step higher than understanding, and that is in the spiritual world's term, the highest. And so when you go into the spirit, it is worship. They that worship God must worship beyond understanding in spirit and in truth. So here is a trust. God, with all your understanding, in other words, you have cushioned yourself. It's a trust back, a trust fall. So totally... And there's a reason for it. And you do not want to lean in your own understanding. You need understanding, but in this case, there's a reason why. And it goes on to say in verse 6, listen carefully, In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We grow from faith to faith, and we progress from faith into faith and progress into what would be ultimate trust in God. Yes, they're all part of the same picture like the ENT, like the intercession and prayer and worship and uh, all of that. But nevertheless, there is a marked difference. You know, when you go to the book of Genesis chapter 12, reading from verses 1 to 5, you're going to find something very interesting. It says here, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? Hold it just a second. In chapter 12, we're told, that God told him, I will give you a son. Chapter 12 and verse 2 and verse 7 says, there will nations come out of that. 
Chapter 13 of Genesis and verse 6, nations will come out that. And he said, yes, I have faith. And yet when it comes to chapter 15, look at what he's saying. He's saying here, Lord, chapter 15 and verse 2, seeing that you, uh, what will you give me, seeing that I'm childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. I'm childless. I waited so long, I've made some preparation. Eliezer, the chief steward of my house, will be the ultimate heir. He's telling God. And Abraham said in verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, look, one born in my house is my heir. Before I go to the next verse, I'd like you to know that faith needs, faith is substance towards hope with no evidence. Faith doesn't need evidence. It just doesn't need. Faith simply says, I have faith, substance without evidence. There's a substance towards hope. Faith doesn't need that evidence. Faith is a noun, pistis. It's simply what we have, what we possess. An adjective is basically describing the level of faith, great faith, little faith, so forth. But then when faith is a verb, it's pistiero, it simply means trust. It simply means no matter what, I'm just going to move. Action, activation. It activates almost everything that faith stands for. It, faith believes the promise. Trust activates the promises. While faith is the noun, here is what happens when it's an action and activates a trust moves out and basically brings out what the promises were. Faith, while it believes, trust confesses. I will say of the Lord, He is one that I trust. So there's a big difference. When you look at trust, there's a, what you call a verb, and yet it has a core consciousness judgment based on time, based on knowledge, based on instinct, and based on experience. Faith doesn't need that. And the reason trust has experience on its side, the reason that trust has experience on its side, instinct on its side, years on its side, and revelation and knowledge on its side, is because it had seen the graciousness of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God. When you turn to Psalm chapter 34 and verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. How can I not trust God? 35 years I have tasted of his goodness and seen his mercy. How can I not trust God? Listen to what Job says. He didn't have the full comprehension of all that would happen to him. He was a man of faith, but he was given to even those times like Elijah, given to those feelings of odd depression sometimes. And yet there's an element of trust based on his walk with God. And you can understand what he says in Job chapter 13 and verse 15. He didn't know verse 40, chapter 42. He doesn't know anything what's going on. Yet this is what he says. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will maintain my own ways before the Lord like I was. I'm not going to change. His wife said, curse God and die. He says, how could you only receive good things from God? We receive all good things. All good things come from him. 
And from the Father in whom there is no variableness, not change. James chapter 1, 17. And yet he says, even if he so desires to send me whatever negative, I'm going to trust him. I've tasted those many years. I simply refuse not to trust him, even if he was to slay me. Trust with an evidence. Look at these years. Woman, do you know how much God has done? Are you crazy? All these years, look at the experience, look at the years, look at the instinct, look at the knowledge and the revelation of God. Looking unto Jesus, author, finisher. And suddenly you realize an amazing aspect of this psalm. Taste and see. You have tasted, you have seen the goodness of God. Blessed is the man that trusts him. You have experience on your side. What I mean is, we have faith in every situation that come our way, or people that come our way, and yet trust, you really can't trust someone until he's proven himself. Big difference. What I mean is faith because we have the faith in God, not in that person. So we will say, yes, but trust is different. Trust is during those years of experience. Trust is because of the longevity and the knowledge you have that person. Trust is simply because you have that instinct that you know this person so well. The trust is because of all of the convincing core of judgment you have about this person these many years. You say, I can take a risk with this man. Walt Disney had come to his friend Art Lingletter and he said, I've got this great plan of building something and a theme around Mouse, I want you to be the first one to jump in and help me out with this. And Art Lingletter said, this goofy idea about some rat running around, you think Americans want to see this nonsense? Are you crazy? And yet Art Lingletter said, tell me what you want. I will put my whole fortune into it. Somebody said, what are you talking about? He says, are you, you think I'm crazy? I know Walt Disney. I don't need a signature. I trust him. I've known him these many years. Trust has evidence. Trust, you have faith in everybody, not everybody you can bring into your, into your home just like that. You have faith the whole world, but you can't just bring everything into your, into your heart. Trust as a way of experience, of years, and knowledge, and revelation. Faith doesn't need that. Faith is unto God. The foundation of our Christian faith in Hebrews chapter 6, repentance from dead work, faith unto God. But I want you to understand what is remarkable is coming back to Genesis chapter 15. Here is what he says in verse 4. Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and no, look, no one, one born in my house is not, one not, is not born in my house is the heir. Didn't God tell you that, and you walked out with faith? In verse 4. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that cometh forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. Listen to what it says in verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad outside the house and said, Look now towards heaven and tell that stars if they be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. Abraham Come out with me. Look at the evidence. Abraham knew the stars. The travels of those nomads. The travels in the dark area deserts with no lamps, no light. is just by the stars. 
The stars have guided him, and here is God that is more accurate. He made the stars. Here is evidence of God that can be trusted. You see, my friend, you cannot trust, simply cannot trust a mythological God, God that is capricious. You really don't know what he is going to do today and what he'll do tomorrow. You got to ring the bell and knock your head, simply wondering which side of the bed these gods have come out. One day they want to blow kiss, the next day they want to blow fire. They're angry. You don't know what their moods are. But when you come into the Bible, is the unchanging God. That's the reason Malachi chapters 3, 6 and verse 8, you are not consumed, O children of Jacob, because he's unchangeable. We change, our fashion change. He was yesterday as he is today, and he will be forevermore. Is this an unconditional love? My salvation doesn't depend on me. I don't feel so happy I lost my salvation. My salvation depends on one who loved me with an everlasting love. And Jesus, whose blood was shed on the cross for me, and his blood will never, never, never lose his power. I want you to understand an important aspect of this evidence. He looked up, and God said, So! shall your seed be. Can you number the stars? Can you number the sands? And look what it says in verse 6. And it says here, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to be for righteousness. And the word that is used in KJV, believed, is the Greek word, is the Hebrew word called Amen. It simply means, and he amened in the Lord, and God counted him for righteousness. Amen simply means trust you. You know, it's a perfunctionary mode of prayer we do. Lord, give me this job. Lord, give me this house. Lord, give me amen. We don't know what we, we don't even think he would do that, right? But we said amen, not knowing. We think amen is a mantra, a chant word. Probably we threw that, and God answers. Amen simply means you trust God. Lord, you answer prayers. You're a rewarder of all those that seek you. Amen. Amen simply means trust you. And that was counted as righteousness. Just before we go further, I want to go into some of the passages that uh, Psalmist is talking about, about this aspect in chapter 34, listen to what he says. I just mentioned in that 34 and verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Same chapter, verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servant, and none of them that trust him in him shall be desolate. Chapter 37, verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shall you dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Verse 5, Commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Verse 40, And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from wicked and save them because they trust in him. I want you to understand, my friend, over the years, till the days of their death, Art Lingletter and Walt Disney were the friends right to the end. They trusted each other. If the enemy can do a number, it's not so much about faith, it destroys your trust in God. Your trust in God have taken your experience, your time, and you've grown as you've grown in your faith. The enemy wants to destroy that trust. By lying, as God said so, he wants to lose your trust. Let me just remind you, in every marriage, you can have, in a busy noon, love just simply runs out of the window. But by night, if the man is gentle and kind, love comes back by midnight. <laughs> but it didn't mean the marriage broke. Money is the biggest sense in marriage. But let me say, money goes, and money comes back double. The marriage sometimes breaks over this foolishness. Happiness 
You're fed, you're happy. Tomorrow you're not fed, you're not happy. And so we're not happy in the home. Some marriages break, but not really good marriages. But a marriage breaks when trust breaks. What holds a marriage is, I don't care, I still trust him, I still trust her. No matter what, it's a trust over the years of experience, over the years of time, attested truth, you know that person. I know that I know, and I will still hold on to it. What I mean, sir, is if ever Satan wants to destroy your walk with God, he will destroy your trust in God. He's a liar. God is a hundred percent trustworthy. He's not capricious. He's not a liar. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. What I mean to say, my friend, is you have what would be trust in God. He's been faithful to you. He's never failed you, although you and I have failed him. He's never. You can trust him till the day of death because it comes with those years of knowledge and experience and time. And so it's amazing. You know, when you think in terms of trust, it's very important you understand the experience that goes with it. You are in a rush and you have to send a parcel maybe to the Caribbean, maybe to Africa, maybe to Asia. And you go to the JFK airport because it's immediate and you know that uh, there's no way you can get that in the next two hours. And so you know this flight is leaving, you look around and you go in and give this package to this person and say, here, this is a very important uh, parcel containing money, precious stones, whatever it is. Can you go in and deliver this to so-and-so? And the man looks at you and says, he is not just an idiot, he's a classic number one idiot. He doesn't know me. He doesn't even know that I could just take and steal the money. I don't know him, I don't know his folks back home. What is he doing? He is a class one idiot. But on the other hand, this man goes in and tells to this person, he spots a guy and says, take this. It's an emergency. When you land there, I'm going to call. My loved one will be waiting, hand it to him. And the man says, do you know me? He says, do I know you? I see you from my house. You're such a honest man. I see you at work. You're a hard worker. Your word is gold. I trust you. Over the years, I've observed you. I know so much about you. You'd be shocked. And everything I know about you is good. I'm so glad that you are going. If you say you will take it, I don't want to worry. I can give my life in your hand. That, my friend, is not idiot. It is being wise. The years of experience have shown that this person is trustworthy. What I mean is, in the combination of faith and trust, you exercise this every day. As you cross the street, you realize that there is the amber light and now it's turning green. And as you cross hillside, you realize too that there is an element of faith and trust. How can you trust the pedestrians? How can you trust the driver? He could be a reckless one that comes. He might not look at the green light. You've heard of people having accident. You also don't know this bus, whether the brake is really good and it's passed all the requirement so you'll be standing there not crossing but over the years of your experience and knowing this place you say you know what faith with trust i'm going to cross we use this every day of our life why because of experience why because of instinct why because of years all of this put together but if you were to ask me what would be the definition of the two there's nothing better than the example of Charles Blondin, one of the great uh, tightrope walker of the 1820. In fact, he's done astounding things, and one of the most marvelous things that he ever did was walking from the borders of United States 
to Canada over Niagara Falls. What is so remarkable is he would actually walk forward and then come backward. And then he took a camera, took photographs of those thousands of people waving at him in the center of the Niagara Falls. And then he moved there and had a breakfast, made an omelet. People had such faith in him. So he brought a wheelbarrow and he said, do you have faith in me? They said, yes, we have faith in you. Both the hands went up. Get into the weed barrel. No. You said you have faith in me. We have faith in you. We've seen all what you did. But wheelbarrow, I don't think so. I just don't trust you that much. Look, Niagara Falls, you're gone. <laughs> but his manager was Harry Colcorn. And he said to Harry, come over, jump on my back. Harry knew Blondin like nobody's business. He had seen Blondin perform years of experience, years of training, years of understanding, revelation, knowledge, all of this. He jumped into his back. Not simply somebody who just walked in, he knew Blondin that well. He knew the margin of error is simply not there because this man practiced every day. This man didn't jump into this just yesterday. He knew the number of times he could trust. And as they were walking with Harry Colcon holding on to Blondin, Blondin said to Harry, Harry, hold on to me. We're not two people. We are one. We're not Harry and Charlie. You are Charlie Borden. Everything I think you think, every move I make you make, don't try to move on your own. We'll both die. There's only one, and you and I together today are Blondin. Trust me implicitly. You will never fail. They crossed and they came back. I want to close the sermon by asking you, you have faith in God. I don't know your situation. I don't know your situation, sir. I don't know your situation, ma'am. But I'm going to ask you to take this exercise of trust. And I'm going to ask you, will you get into the wheelbarrow and take a journey of trusting God, knowing by the years of experience that you've had and the knowledge that you have, you say, I don't know anything about myself, but I know he knows my future. I don't know anything about what is going on in my life, in my business, but he's the one who started me. He's the author. He will be the finisher. Count me in the wheelbarrow. If that's what you are, just before Pastor Hans comes, I want you to walk down the aisles, so to speak, into this wheelbarrow of trust and take a step and say, I trust you no matter what. I will believe you, Lord. And that was counted as righteousness. I'm going to pray right now. I'm not waiting for invitation. I'm just going to pray right now. There are people in the situation where they are. You have faith, but I want you to trust God and say, I trust you. Forget about the Niagara Fall. I can trust you in the Niagara Falls of my life. I can trust you as I trusted you. When I needed that job, when I needed the green card, when I needed the papers, I can trust you when my child was sick and yesterday I could trust you today. My trust has only grown over the years. Ah, my knowledge of you, you are perfect. You are one that will never lie and your word will never lie. Lord, I step into the wheelbarrow. Take a step and put your leg up and here I stand. 
I thank you, Lord. I trust in you. I have tasted and I have seen your goodness. And today I'm blessed that I trust in you. Bless your people. Increase their faith. And moving from faith to faith into trust with all their heart. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. The choir is coming to sing and Pastor Hans is coming in a moment. Let's just worship the Lord. That's what I said. I forgot.
You could be seated just for a moment. We just want to take this moment to thank all our friends that are watching from across the world. Thank you so much. And if you like this, please share it. So the rest of the people, thank you for being so many that watch this. Uh, once again, let me ask you, you have faith in God. I'm going to ask you, take a higher step to trust Him implicitly because God is a good God. You have tasted of His goodness and you've seen His goodness. You can only trust in God. Thank you for being with us. We're going to sign off. God bless you till we come back again the same time next week. God bless you. Just before Pastor Mary comes for the offering and to bless, let me just say this. The Camp of the Word, the mandatory meeting will be held today. Immediately following the 10th of the service, that's the meeting after the service. We'll be in the chapel for instructions and if you missed out this call